Okay, good morning everybody and, and welcome. I can see lots of you arriving now. Um, welcome to our sixth webinar um, for the Greater Cambridge Local Plan Consultation Stage Proposals for um, uh, our preferred options or the first proposals as we're calling it. Um, we've had five sessions already. Um, all of those were themed sessions around the themes of the local plan. Um, and this session today is around North East Cambridge um, and the local plan, specifically this site, because as you may or may or not know, um, we have a separate AAP process or an area action plan process that has been going on um, kind of simultaneously alongside the, um, the local plan. And um, it's one of the sites proposed and we thought it would be helpful to really have a bit of an explainer around that, where we're at with that process, the relationship with the local plan, um, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for all of the people joining us and welcome this morning and welcome back to people who have been before and welcome to you who haven't managed to, to come to these sessions before. We've got a good panel this morning or this afternoon, shall I say, um, and a few slides um, taking you through some of the updates um, and we'll run a little interactive session in the middle. Um, there'll be chance for questions all the way through the presentations as well, which we'll endeavour to answer. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take myself off screen here and I'm going to introduce you to our super panel this morning. So I'll ask them to all put their video cameras on. So if you can all put your video cameras on, I'll come to you and then you can introduce yourselves. Um, so I'm going to go around my screen. Matt. Hi, everyone. Um... I'm Matthew Patterson, so I'm one of the project leads delivering the NEC AAP on behalf of the Shared Planning Service for Greater Cambridge. Hey Matt, really good to have you this, um, today. Um, we're on to Caroline. Good morning, I'm Caroline Hunt. I'm Strategy and Economy Manager in the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service and uh, uh, overseeing both the local plan and the area action plan. Thanks, Caroline. Nice to have you along. Terry. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm Terry D'Souza. So I'm a Principal Planning Policy Officer for the Shared Planning Service, and I work with Caroline and Matt and others in um, helping to bring together the Area Action Plan and the evidence studies that underpin, underpin it. Thanks, Terry. It's good to have you here as well this morning. Um, behind the scenes, I keep saying this morning, it feels like this morning, um, behind the scenes we've got Will Smeaton and Tim Cliff, um, obviously not got their cameras on, but without them we wouldn't be running this, they're doing all the logistics and technical stuff, so hopefully it all goes relatively smoothly this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Frayner, I'm the Assistant Director for Strategy and Economy, so part of the team that's bringing the AAP and also the local plan together. Um, just a quick outline, I'll share my screen again, give you a bit of an outline of what the session it's going to look like um, so and how we're going to run it and um, you can post in the chat anonymously um, at any time we'll answer the questions the panelists will try and answer questions as we go along but there will be some time at the end as well for um, for you know some more panel questions you can post anonymously um, or leave your name it's up to you it's an hour's long if we over on a little bit I'm not too fussed if there's plenty of questions if we don't get to all the questions some of them might have been answered in previous sessions already um, and I can highlight to where you need to go to get to those questions and those answers and if we don't manage to get to any questions we will try and pick them up and put them into our FAQs section on the website which I'll point you in the right direction so just a brief overview of today's session and um, we're going to talk a little bit about the relationship of North East Cambridge with the local plan or the emerging local plan that's in consultation at the moment um, and try and demystify a little bit of the process around the AAP um, and the relationship with the local plan because we appreciate it's quite a complicated planning piece um, that the two processes working through. Um, we're also going to give you a bit of an update on the AAP and what's changed um, and we'll get some views about what you think about that during an interactive session and then pick up some of the benefits and some of the challenges at the end and then we'll give you a chance to actually ask the panel some further questions if you do have any by that stage. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Caroline, I believe who's starting the slides off for us. Caroline. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm going to run you through um, some of the overarching issues around North East Cambridge. And as Paul said, we're preparing two plans at the moment that um, both deal with North East Cambridge, so I think it would be helpful just to explain how they relate to each other 
um, and their process and timetable for moving forwards. So some of you will know we've been preparing an area action plan for Northeast Cambridge uh, for some years now, um, and that reflects um, policies in our current adopted 2018 local plans that identify potential for this area for uh, redevelopment. Um, but we have also looked in preparing our new Greater Cambridge local plan and our first proposals uh, that are out for consultation at the moment, and that work has confirmed uh, North East Cambridge as part of the strategy for the new local plan. And we'll run through a little bit of both of those plans and, and, and what they do and how they work. Um, and North East Cambridge provides then a more detailed planning framework for the North East Cambridge area specifically. Um, and the timetable for the area action plan is that we are uh, having undertaken several rounds of consultation, taking a report through our member processes uh, having just published the report this week, um, and Terry will talk you through that in more detail uh, shortly. Um, and in terms of the local plan, we're out for consultation on those first proposals. Uh, so there's an opportunity to comment around North East Cambridge as part of the local plan consultation. So if we then think about the local plan, um, specifically, call on the next slide please. Um, the local plan looked at a range of strategic options for development. Um, it identified a vision very much to focus development in locations where um, use of the car was minimised because our evidence showed that was how you made the biggest impact on carbon emissions as part of our move towards uh, a net zero carbon strategy. Um, and North East Cambridge actually came out as the most sustainable location for development in Greater Cambridge, reflecting the, um, it's, it's, it's in Cambridge, uh, it has the Cambridge North Station, it has the busway out from Huntingdon, and it has proposals from Great, the Greater Cambridge Partnership for links up to Water Beach, you've got the Chisholm Trail, you've got cycling, you've got city access, so there's an awful lot of existing and proposed infrastructure that makes this a particularly sustainable location for development. So next slide, please, Paul. Um, so having identified this as a really sustainable location for development, um, we have looked at, um, through the local plan, drawing on the findings of the area action plan that we consulted on last year, uh, what this, what the vision for this area could, could be and how we could make best use of this brownfield site within Cambridge with that really high uh, accessibility um, credentials. So um, we're, we're envisaging this as a new city district for Cambridge. Um, it's, a, it's a really sizable site and it has really um, strong potential for development. But of course, at the moment, it is home to the chemical wastewater treatment works. And that's been a barrier for development in this area for many years. Um, but we know that there is now proposals from um, Anglian Water in particular, looking at relocation of the wastewater treatment works and um, to a new site um, at Honey Hill is their preferred um, location as they are going through their separate process. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize that it's a separate process, not part of the, uh, the area action plan or the local plan. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and as I said, we've published papers now for the area action plan to go through its committee process, starting with the first meeting at the joint local planning advisory group uh, next week on the 22nd. Next slide, please, Paul. Uh, so looking at what we, the potential thing we think that North East Cambridge has, um, we think that has potential for over 8,000 new homes and 15,000 um, additional jobs, recognising it's already a successful area with the Cambridge Science Park and St John's Innovation Centre and so on. Um, 
and uh, but important also, particularly given congestion and also as part of meeting our housing needs, to bring some housing development into that area as well. Um, but it's not just about homes and jobs, it's also about the supporting infrastructure that makes it a really um, good place to live, to have all those services and facilities on your, on your doorstep. Um, so schools, community and cultural facilities, open space and links also out into the wider countryside and we'll say more about that because our strategy in our new local plan isn't just about homes and jobs, it's also about the green infrastructure that is really important as part of our quality of life uh, every day and if, if you know that's something that's re been really highlighted hasn't it through the pandemic, the importance of having access to informal green space and there are initiatives identified through the local plan that come very close to North East Cambridge and provide real opportunities to provide that accessibility to the wider area. Next slide please Paul. So before we move into, um, Paul I think you might have missed the slide, thank you. Um, before we move into the um, more detail around the proposals for the site, I think it is important that we we do discuss the relationship with the water treatment plant uh, process. So, as I said, both the local plan and the air action plan are predicated on the treatment plant having relocated. So that separate DCO process um, is. Uh, is, is absolutely key to this site being able to come forward. Um, if it's not approved, then we would need to look again. So it's, you know, it's quite significant in, in the process for both plans. Um, so for the local plan, we can progress forward to the draft plan stage, which would be the next stage but um, we wouldn't be able to progress the local plan forward to the formal proposed submission stage until we know the outcome of the DCO, because part of that formal stage and submitting a plan for examination, you need to be able to demonstrate that your proposals are deliverable. And until we know uh, if and when the DCO, uh, the Water Treatment Works would, uh, would relocate, we can't demonstrate and rely on development in North East Cambridge. And similarly for the Area Action Plan, that also can't progress to that uh, formal submission stage. So the decision that uh, members are being are, will be asked to make um, is, is around the proposed submission plan uh, to be ready for consultation, but it will be paused and that consultation would not take place until such time as the DCO is determined and if it is approved. Um, we do expect that the development control consent order examination process will, will look to these plans, our plans, you know, they will look to showing how uh, sustainable the site is and the merits of development in, in this area, but they are two separate processes. Next slide please Paul. Um, so if the DCO is approved on its uh, current timetable. Um, we envisage that we would be able to take both plans forward for their formal uh, publication for representations to be made ahead of examination around 2024. Obviously, we need to keep that under review and we certainly need to make a, a health check of the area action plan to see whether any changes in circumstances meant we needed to update the evidence or change the AAP at that, at that point. Uh, and just talking uh, still around the relationship between our plans and the Water Treatment Works relocation, what our appraisals will do, so they don't look at the alternative sites for the Water Treatment Works, that's covered by a separate process, but they do look at the cumulative impacts of our plans with the plans of others, other plans and projects, and that would include wastewater treatment relocation. So I appreciate it's quite a technical process and it probably doesn't always feel logical when you're looking from, uh, from outside, but that's the way that the, that the system will, will work. Next slide, please, Paul. Um, I think 
there were two other issues I just wanted to highlight um, at the outset here before we look at the AAP in more detail. And that's around how water supply is dealt with because it, those of you that have been engaging in any of our discussions around the new Great Cambridge local plan will have heard us say time and again, we recognise that water supply is a really important issue. And for the local plan, it would be predicated on that uh, adequate water supply being resolved um, at later stages in the plan. Uh, and because the AAP is at a more advanced stage, we need to have a very clear policy position now in order to take the plan forward through its committee stages. Um, now, the action plan policies propose the same sort of phasing as delivery as the local plan, but the policies are very clear that that can only take place if there's evidence um, that uh, there will be adequate water supply without causing unacceptable environmental harm. We also know that the AAP will not actually go forward to its formal examination stages until uh, Water Resources East have prepared a new water management plan, um, and that should give us the um, clarity we need and hopefully the confidence that we need that there will be an adequate water supply. Okay, so one more issue from me. I also wanted to pick up the Fen Road level crossing, which um, is an issue that comes up um, in the consultations that we've undertaken on the area action plan, and I anticipate will also come up through the local plan consultation. Um, because this is a, you know, this is an important issue locally and particularly for communities um, living in Fen Road um, and uh, affected by traffic waiting to cross, uh, cross the uh, crossing into Fen Road. Uh, the councils have been um, pushing quite hard for uh, this to be an issue that Network Rail should, should be looking at because the downtime at the crossing now is really significant. It's over half an hour in every hour that the gates are down. So we think it is a really important issue that should be being looked at. Network Rail is currently consulting on an Ely area capacity study is the name of their project, which is looking at level crossings between Ely and Cambridge. Um, and unfortunately they've concluded in their current consultation that they don't think any further intervention is needed now. We are currently preparing to make our formal response to emphasise very strongly that we consider that's an important issue. Network Rail came to the North Area Committee last week and indicated they'd welcome further engagement with the Council, so we will very much be holding to them to that and wanting to have that, those further discussions, and that we will do alongside work on the new local plan, but we say that's a separate issue from the Area Action Plan itself. So that's it from me. I know there's quite a lot of technical stuff in there, but I hope it's helpful just to set that context before we look at in more detail at the Air Action Plan. And I'm now going to hand over to Terry to take you through uh, information on that. Thank you, Caroline. So, so yeah, so just a quick recap, I suppose, of where we are with the AAP process and where we've come from, I suppose. Um, so for those of you that may remember, we did an issues and options consultation back in 2014. Um, so at that time, um, the site was known as Cambridge Northern Fringe East. Uh, and that basically just included the land that was kind of the eastern side of Milton Road, where the wastewater treatment plant is at the moment, um, and some of the land around it. It was a much smaller kind of... Um, um, area than what is currently proposed um, and then in 2019 we did another round of issues and options consultation so there was about 80 odd questions that we asked uh, for comments on and um, we actually amended the site boundary at that stage to include Cambridge Science Park because obviously the Science Park is a really important local um, local regional employer in the area and actually they're a really big part of North East Cambridge um, so it kind of made sense to include them as part of the proposals. Um, that was a really positive consultation and we received um, a, a number of responses to that. That then helped us to draft the, um, the area action plan, which went out for consultation last year. So that was kind of July to October. And it was at that stage where we moved away from 
here are some questions tell us what you think to here is a proposed vision here are some objectives policies uh, and a spatial framework uh, which is essentially like a a diagram as to show how the area could be laid out spatially um, and, and we asked for for comments on on those on those things um, and that was a really again a really positive consultation we had over 4,000 uh, individual representations from that consultation um, from a wide range of backgrounds uh, which was which was really good um, and as part of that consultation we again we amended the boundary of the site so it included Cambridge Regional College um, again a really important um local site in the, in the local area um you know over three thousand students so it was important they were part of the area and it it was kind of seemed to sort of embed it within northeast cambridge rather than it just being uh, on the fringes but it also excluded the bramble fields local nature reserve and the nuffield road allotments because we weren't actually proposing anything for those areas um given given their kind of uses and sensitivities so we just, we thought it was um prudent to um, exclude them um Paul, can we go on to the next slide, please? So on the consultation from last year, there were a number of kind of key issues that came out of it. Um, just very broadly, one was the open space provision on site. So at that time, the AAP was proposing around 10 and a half hectares of additional open space on site. And people thought that that wasn't enough, wasn't sufficient for the number of homes that we were proposing. Um, people were concerned around building heights and densities. So thinking about, um, you know, some of the, uh, it didn't necessarily reflect the, some, you know, the character kind of existing in some of the emerging character um, of the city and also the wider impacts that would ha have on the sort of Fen landscape. And also the densities as well. People were concerned that um, the site was, was too dense and in combination with the open space provision, um, it was um, to quote kind of claustrophobic in, in some ways. People were also worried about employment numbers, that the site was was um, was promoting too much uh, employment floor space. And therefore, there was an imbalance between not only homes and jobs, but also the fact that it would then result in more in commuting into northeast Cambridge. Um, um, and therefore, you know, kind of going against the kind of sustainable um, vision that we had for the site. People were concerned that the community facilities weren't adequate enough and they thought that we needed to do more work on that, which we which we have done. Um, and then, as I've mentioned before, managing traffic traffic levels, um, you know, thinking about the amount of development that we're proposing for North East Cambridge, people were obviously concerned that, you know, this would just result in tailbacks, you know, all the way up the A10 and um, all the way um, along the A14. So th those were the kind of key key issues that came out. So. In terms of the vision for North East Cambridge, we, um, it's still largely the same, although we have made some, some amendments to it. So we wanted to make sure that we emphasize the, the kind of healthy and inclusive um, place that we want, we wanted North East, we want North East Cambridge to be, and particularly thinking about kind of its walkability, and I'll come on to that um, in, a, in a moment. Um, and also just, and also thinking about how it would be about high quality as well, because, you know, with, with higher density development, well, we've all development, to be perfectly honest, but with high density development, there is a concern that if it's not done well, then actually you could end up with a really poor place. Um, so it's about making sure that, you know, we we, ha we have really good, strong kind of principles and foundations um, for, for development in North East Cambridge to make sure that you 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 get the, the right type of development um, that's going to leave a, you know, a positive lasting legacy. Paul. So looking at the kind of proposed changes, this is just a very brief summary of, of the changes that we've made. But so coming on to the open space provision, um, we've, we, we took, it, took it right back basically and looked at you know, how much, you know, what, what does the existing local plan standards require? Um, and how can, we, how can we accommodate as much of that on site as possible? Um, a lot of the comments as well, we're talking around um, COVID and the fact that people really, used their local spaces a lot particularly during the lockdowns and how those kind of informal spaces so you know the commons the local parks the rec grounds the children's play spaces were just so incredibly important to so many people at that time um, so we've amended the spatial framework now which is this diagram here on the left and the, um, the site now based on the new diagram the new policies it meets the informal open space and the children's play space in full on site so that's not us relying on other sites like Milton Country Park to meet to meet those standards. 
it means that people, everyone, every single home at North East Cambridge will be within a five minute walk from their doorstep to an open space. So that's something that we really wanted to make sure um, we, um, we not only provided the, the open spaces, but actually distributed them around the site in a way that was easily accessible to everyone. Building heights, we've, we've undertaken further work. So we've done further heritage studies, we've done townscape studies as well, looking at the impacts on the existing communities as well as further afield. And we've reduced the building heights as well. So now generally speaking, building heights are around four to six stories, whereas before they were generally five to eight. And even the proposed sort of landmark building that we've got proposed for North East Cambridge, it's come down from 13 stories to 10 stories. So that kind of puts it on a par with, roughly speaking, with kind of um, Parkside, Poli Parkside Fire Station in terms of um, sort of uh, in terms of meterage heights. The densities have also been reduced. So previously they went up to kind of 385 dwellings per hectare. Um, now the densities are between 70 along kind of Nuffield Road. Um, and backing onto the existing residential houses. And then they peak at 300 dwellings per hectare in the center. So to give that some sort of context, 70, 70 DPH is around, kind of like what you have around in the Romsey Mill Road area of Cambridge at the moment, whereas 300 dwellings per hectare is kind of um, what you get at around the sort of CB1 area around Cambridge Station. And that is only one block at the district center that is at 300 dwellings per hectare. Everything else is broadly speaking around 180 to 240. So it, it's, it's significantly reduced at that, at that top end um, in terms of densities. The important thing about densities though is that you still, it, it's still important that you kind of get the critical mass of people um, to, to, to make this a, a new city district. Um, with, with densities, if you go, there's, there's, there's always the risk that if you go potentially too low then you don't necessarily get all of the infrastructure um, and facilities that you need to make it a self-sustaining place so you know the schools the the healthcare, the cultural facilities community facilities you know they all need a critical mass even you know the bus the bus routes and everything else they all need a critical mass in order to make sure that they're deliverable we've reduced the number of jobs on site so we've gone down from twenty thousand to fifteen thousand new jobs and that's still a significant number of jobs but actually you know it's it's helped us in terms of making sure that we can manage the number of vehicles coming into northeast cambridge a lot better uh, and it also makes sure that we don't have a negative impact on some of the other employment sites that are in the other parts of greater cambridge so in water Beach or in camborne or in in, in in other areas we're still making sure that we reprovide the same amount of industrial floor space um, in North East Cambridge. So we're still proposing to move the industrial uses from Nuffield Road Industrial Estate into Cowley Road Industrial Estate and around the aggregates railheads um, to sort of act as a buffer to, um, to those uses. Um, but we're, um, we're making sure that we're, we're protecting those floor spaces to, because they're, they're re a really important employ, uh, employment area for, for, local, for local people, but also cities need you know those types of uses to, to function people need to get their cars cars mot'd people need scaffolding when they're doing work to their house uh, we've clarified our infrastructure requirements for our infrastructure studies um, and there's more information in the plan about that from kind of schools health hubs um, and, and those types of uses and we've now got an agreed transport strategy which helps to make sure that we can deliver our transport policies and uh, work within the trip budget for north east cambridge and then, Paul, if you just go on to the last slide from me, it just sets out the change between the draft spatial framework on the left and the proposed spatial framework on the right. And essentially, um, you've got a really kind of clear green network now, which runs both sides of Milton Road, um, really linking in as well to the wider area. So into kind of um, North Chesterton, into King's Edges, uh, but also over towards the, the river to make sure people have access um, to the wider countryside. Um, as I mentioned before, every home will be within five minute walk of, a, of, of an open space and also every home will be within a five minute walk of a local centre or district centre, which will meet their day to day needs. So it's really focusing on that kind of, you know, walkability, easy access to, to facilities. Um, and I think that kind of emphasises the point that Caroline was saying earlier about, you know, most sustainable location out of all of the sites in, in Greater Cambridge. And it's about making sure that you know, it's not just about going to work and jumping in your car, but it's also, you know, going out for a pint of milk or, you know, taking your kids to school and making sure that, you know, all of that is done in, in the most sustainable ways possible. So on that, I think I'll pass back over to you, Paul. Terry, thank you very much. Um, and Caroline as well. I think that was 
Yeah, really helpful. I mean, I know that there was some detail in there, um, but I think it's really helpful to give you a clear picture of um, some of the technical stuff that we've had to kind of navigate, as well as also certainly the updates from where we've gone from the previous round of consultation and some of the work that Terry and Matt and the team have been doing. Um, this is really fantastic piece of work that's been happening. Um, so what we'd like to do, and just, just a, a quick reminder that obviously all of the sessions, all of the webinar sessions are up online at the moment, all the previous ones. This session will be exactly the same. It will go up online probably by the end of today, this week. Um, so you'll be able to access it, access all the slides as well. Um, apologies for that. Um, and, you know, and then and, and revisit some of the things that you've been, we've been talking about. What I'd like to do now is, I don't know how many of you have had some of these sessions before, we'd like to ask you a couple of questions yourselves, get you a bit involved. You can see some questions coming through in the chat and we'll, we'll pick them up as we go through. Um, those of you who haven't used Mentee before, Mentee Meter is a interactive kind of session piece. You can scan the QR code um, or you can visit menti.com and stick that code in there, voting code 95228. And we'll ask you some questions and get you involved. And my panel as well, can you put your cameras back on as well, please, so people can see you. So um, we can actually get back involved in the conversation as some of the questions and thoughts come through to everyone. Um, so, firstly, you know, you've heard a little bit from Terry now um, about, you know, what the vision is, how it's changed, and those of you who have been involved and know, know about the plan, um, you know, previously, you know, you would have seen its evolution right back from kind of 2014, really. So, I think we'd like to really ask you, you know, what parts of this vision that you feel particularly excited about, or, you know, parts of the vision that you feel are, you know, are really good opportunities for not just the city of Cambridge, but also for the wider area, for the people who live here, for the people who live in now, for the people who live here in the future. So as I said, if you go to that Menti code, you should be able to stick in some some thoughts. So this, I think I've allowed a word count of five, but you can put in as many as you want, really. Um, and while we're waiting for some of your thoughts to come through, please do go on there. We're waiting for some of your thoughts to come through. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask some of the panel what you they think. And Matt, I'm going to come to you because you've had some serious involvement in this project for quite some time, really, and, and other projects as well. So, what are the things that you feel have most excited you about, sort of the new vision, as it were? Yeah, I think for me, it's the ability for us to, in undertaking wholesale regeneration of this area, to look at, in particular, some of those key barriers that that are limiting this area in particular the road networks that we have around and the rail and the bus linkages as well while they provide excellent um public transport opportunities and and connectivity they also provide physical barriers to movement and what the aap seeks to do is to as well as regenerate Northeast Cambridge, knit this area into its surrounding communities and, and location. And by doing that as well, doing it in a way that we can promote walking and cycling as the primary choice of travel around here and make this a kind of new exemplar. I mean, Cambridge has a long and, and very successful um, uh, history of, of cycle use in the area that that's the envy of everywhere else uh, nationally. And we can build on that as well through the proposals for NEC and really drive a new sort of place that, that is really connected, really um, usable in terms of walking, cycling and all the facilities in the area um, that, that provides everyone with fantastic opportunities uh, to live, to, um, for employment and for connectivity to other facilities that we have across Cambridge as well. So yeah, that's what I'm really excited about. Yeah, thanks Matt. And I think we can see some of those thoughts coming through and people people getting involved now. I mean, walkability obviously comes up really strongly in there, but I mean, her, um, Terry talked quite a lot about, you know, the, re, the review of the green spaces as well. And, and you know, don't forget nature yet, of course. And, and, and you know, as Carol mentioned earlier on underpinning not just NEC, but our entire strategy for the, the local plan is both climate and, and you know biodiversity and green spaces. And I think the changes that we've made have reflected that. And um, you know, I think well, what's the what are the what are the distances from uh, green open spaces, Terry? Refresh me. Yeah, so every home will be within a five-minute walk of an open space. So that will include you know kind of 
um, sort of kick around sort of spaces. There's a sort of a larger green space that we propose now in the centre, um, sort of in addition to the kind of the linear park that we've we've got along the first drain, uh, but also a lot more kind of local um, parks as well. So you know various size um, sizes and shapes, but you know those sorts of things that you could sort of just just go to um, as an easy stroll rather than it being a an event having to you know make the effort to go and visit something yeah and Paul perhaps just picking up on that because I've seen there's a question from uh in, in in the chat from CPPF about um the potential impact that northeast Cambridge might have on the wider area and you know would it impact on uh places like Wick and Fen for example I think it's really important to stress that so uh, our the revisions to the air action plan meet our informal open space standards in full on site so we're not relying on off-site provision but I think it's also important to recognize that we are providing connections um, over to over the railway so that people can connect into the wider footpath network so along the cam and so on uh, but also there are going to be three ways of connecting north um, over or under the A14 um, and that's that that's really important in terms of the wider green infrastructure strategy that we have we um, we didn't specifically have a map on that in, in the slideshow but there's an area to the north of Cambridge the area between Milton and Histon and wrapping right up to Water Beach and, and Coton that our green infrastructure strategy work identified as a North Cambridge green space to provide enhanced recreation facilities so whilst that's a local plan proposal you know the northeast cambridge area and with that connectivity will will have on the back of that wider infrastructure provision um, real opportunities for access into the wider countryside um, and, and and should that sh you know should really help reduce uh, pressures on some of these more sensitive spaces that are you know, still some way away um, from, from the area. And that has been looked at carefully through our sustainability appraisal and our habitats regulation assessment. And I'm, I'm sure um, some of you will want to look at those and see, you know, what they've concluded. But uh, we, we think that that wider green infrastructure strategy is really important. Um, there's also a, a, another uh, enhanced area to, to the east as well, uh, over into the east from Fen. So, uh, this isn't just about development, it is about green space too. And I think that's really important to see it in that wider context. Yeah, and sorry, on, on that point, sorry, just to come in on the Cheston Fen point. So, um, so yeah, the, 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 the area that we call Cheston Fen isn't within the area action plan boundary. It's the land kind of between the railway and the river. Um, now, there is potential for that area to be uh, used for kind of biodiversity enhancement and um, informal amenity space. But because it is within the flood zone, it's not something that we can necessarily you uh, you know define as you know this is informal public open space. These are children's play spaces. These are football pitches because you know they potentially can't be used all year round. So um, the kind of aspiration is that that will become a kind of a biodiversity and um, informal amenity space that would link up the river um, and the northeast Cambridge um, site. Now you know. That footbridge, therefore, to go over from northeast Cambridge into that area is really, really important for that. And as Caroline was saying, in terms of general kind of movement into the wider countryside, you know, if you lived in northeast Cambridge, to get onto the river towpath without that bridge would actually be quite a cumbersome route. You'd have to come all the way down to Moss Bank or you'd have to go through Milton Country Park and work your way up. So actually, it's a really important piece of infrastructure that would, you know, be of real benefit to, to the site. Yeah, thanks, Terry, Caroline, and, and others. And I mean, you know, I'm going to move over to the second question, which is sort of the reverse of this question now. And um, I just sort of mentioned, you know, obviously one of the things that hasn't come up in some of this is around the, the climate issues. And as you know, you know, we'll have a whole session. You can refer back to the green, uh, green spaces and biodiversity webinar for what Caroline and Terry have been talking about. But obviously, climate and you know the absolute requirement for us to, to get to zero carbon and um, within the green timeline set in the sixth carbon budget, you know, does have an implication on where we put things and, you know, the strategy is reflected on that. And, you know, North East Cambridge is a very, very sustainable location as well. Um, so moving on. So conversely, 
and you know again same entity code you should be able to answer this one straight away as well and um, before we go over to do a bit more do, do a few more slides is you know what parts of that vision for northeast cambridge are you worried about and i did notice some of the comments coming through and um, you know obviously we do understand the concerns around the relocation of the water treatment works and obviously caroline's and um, gone into detail about that and there is further detail on that and you know truck planning a lot of the time is a very kind of emotive and sensitive topic and um, you know we know that we understand that we're all planners and you know we worked in very many environments where we've had to make decisions that not everyone likes and you know but we have done quite a lot of work on this and you know i think that probably terry and his team i think this is one of the most detailed action plans i've seen and it is it is, it is exciting i think it's genuinely exciting but uh, you know there are things that people are going to be worried about we want to make sure that we can address them absolutely as far as we possibly can so you know please stick your comments in here as we we, we talk over i know that we we mentioned some of the issues that have cropped up recently in terms of the fen road issue and some of the issues that we kind of come across are that quite a lot of the way that we work in planning especially in, in the uk is quite dependent on other organizations you know there's certain things that are within our gift but we have to work together you know with both central government and other partners to deliver things and and you know that's that is complicated um so yeah water supply i mean water supply is one of the things that's that's i think it's front and center of our entire local plan and, and and you know our whole strategy is is um is only deliverable on the fact that if water can be um the issues with water can be mitigated and you know new regional scale infrastructure can be in place to deliver during that plan period where we know that we've got no more headroom within within the um within the, the water companies um Paul, oh, can I just can I just comment um, on um, the, the the concerns that people are highlighting, which I think are, are you know very real uh, concerns. One of the um, interesting areas that is being discussed, not just in relation to this site, but but actually uh, across the kind of planning landscape at the moment, picking up on um, all of the issues that people are we can see on the Menti plan, is effectively how do you make good places? How do you make inclusive places? How do you make places that are not um, either mono tenure uh, or indeed are uh, so dispersed that there is no um, economic uh, driver for the kind of amenities and the important places where people can interact um, and where families can uh, mix uh, with, with other parts of the community. Um, and one of the issues that is emerging, uh, and, and it's a reflection in some respects of why North East Cambridge could be um, a, a very uh, positive uh, space, uh, is this dynamic about uh, population densities. Now we can talk about heights of buildings and densities of buildings and so on, but actually increasingly um, uh, elements of population density and also workplace and population density and the relationship of them have been really central to some of the thinking around North East Cambridge. Um, so sites like Camborne, for example, are very relatively low density locations where because of that, people are quite remote from any form of centre. People don't walk into the centre or don't encounter one another. Uh, and uh, I'm not using London as a reference point, but a few years ago, um, there was a lot of work done by uh, the GLA around London's high streets and why they were so exciting and dynamic and vibrant places. And what they found effectively when they mapped all of the different land uses and all of the different activities, and importantly, all of the different people that were using that space, that street each day, that became part of the, uh, that understanding that having um, uh, school children and um, parents and working uh, and retail and cafes and barbers and all of those kind of things, as well as workspaces, right on top of each other, created um, much more uh, interaction, created much more comfortable, but importantly, much more economically successful and sustainable localities. And for all of the concerns that people are highlighting in um, North East Cambridge, I think one of the issues around density um, of population uh, is, uh, you know, some of these issues are addressed because we don't see them perhaps in Cambridge's growth in relatively low density suburban 
forms of development. Um, one of the things that's different about North East Cambridge is its potential to address some of those matters in a different way. Um, so I just I just wanted to kind of, uh, uh, as I say, put a bit of a counterpoint to some of these things require things like density of population. Um, and how do you think, uh, and your comments on this as we go forwards, but how do you think we can achieve that um, in an appropriate form? And Terry's talked about some of the changes that we've that we've made, but it but what you want to achieve in terms of those concerns in part are a function of population densities um, in, in locations going forward. Thanks, Stephen. And, and what we, we've, um, I didn't introduce you at the bidding kicking because you, I knew you were joining late. So this is Stephen, he's, uh, he's Director of Planning and Economic Development for those of you who don't know him um, as well. So he'll be joining the panel. So seeing questions come through now, thank you for engaging with this. It's been it's really interesting to see some of the comments coming through. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to the last little part now um, where I'm going to hand over to Matt and we will start answering some questions as we go through. So Matt, I think this is these are next for you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, so hopefully everyone's aware that both of the local authorities have declared climate change emergencies um, and the sustainability agenda has grown massively um, in the last 10 years and more and is at the forefront. And that's certainly come through in the consultation responses that we've had to both issues and options and to the draft plan um, uh, about the priority that we should be placing in the plan on addressing uh, sustainability generally. Uh, and therefore we've proposed uh, very ambitious targets within the plan, uh, stretch targets beyond national standards, uh, in particular, we're promoting obviously net zero carbon development, but we're also trying to drive down uh, water consumption from, we're currently across Cambridge, we've got a, um, a, a per person use of around about 133 litres. The government's target is 110 litres per person and we are proposing 80 litres per person. So we're really stretching those targets. Um, we are not promoting any fossil fuels, so no gas boilers or anything else, recognising the direction of travel that needs to be taken there. But likewise, driving down energy consumption through, well, we'd, we'd like to have promoted a, a sort of district-wide heat and energy network. Actually, the work that we did identified that actually we were better off looking at smaller scale uh, decarbonised energy networks uh, across the area, so that's what's being promoted. But that will um, help reduce the, the draw on the national grid. Um, we have, again, through our evidence base, said that 10% net biodiversity gain would be uh, achievable, but uh, seeking to move that to a higher target would be challenging, but we've gone for the higher target in, in a 20% net biodiversity gain across the area. Um, we think that's the right thing to do in terms of making uh, everyone try to at least achieve the targets on site where they can. And that should be the aspiration here is to really challenge the development industry to deliver on our, our expectations, I think, as uh, local authorities, but as a community for them to do as much as possible that they can on site. Um, we are promoting 100% uh, EV charging as well, recognising again the direction of travel towards electric vehicles um, being the dominant form in the future. Um, and then looking at how we manage traffic generally, even with EVs, they will drive improved air quality across the area, but that doesn't reduce traffic really. Um, so again, through the AAP, we're promoting uh, a trip budget. That trip budget has other elements to it as well. We're looking at car barns so people don't have ready access to their, their vehicles. Uh, we're promoting delivery hubs for to do the last green mile journeys across the area to ensure that we intercept uh, those trips before they enter into the area. So looking further afield, looking at Milton Park and Riders, potentially some of those uh, locations where we can intercept uh, vehicles before they come in. 
Um, there was a question, I think, in the chat about air quality. The air quality of the area is not fantastic in terms of it's mainly affected by the existing traffic air quality off the A14. Um, but obviously with the further uh, greening of the area that we're seeking to do, the move to EV charging, EV vehicles, we hopefully will see a significant reduction in uh, or improvement in air quality across the piece. Um, we note that development's going to take a while before, before we see real development on site. So some of those things will start to come into play anyway. Thanks, Paul. Do you want to move on? And the other key benefits to the site, are obviously, with the number of housing that we're promoting, we're also promoting a significant amount of those to be affordable housing. Um, the government has set some requirements around that affordable housing, in particular first homes, which are discounted market housing for first time buyers. But beyond that, we're looking at a, a combination of different types of forms of affordable housing um, from affordable rent right through to social rent, um, as well as low cost uh, housing products for, uh, for sale as well. Uh, recognising that we have significant needs right across Cambridge because of our high house prices, um, that there is those that are on low wages that, that need support, as well as those in the middle income bands as well that are struggling to get onto the housing ladder or find suitable accommodation as well. So we have the ability through the AAP to provide for a wide range of different types of housing types and and tenures to help people that are finding themselves in, in housing constraint. Uh, in particular, again, we're just back on that slide, sorry. Uh, there, we are looking towards things like custom and self-built housing. We still see that there to be a role here, in particular, um, providing custom housing where people buy a shell and core effectively and then fit it out as their as they move in and they can then fit it out in their own time, um, but at least allows them to get onto the housing ladder. And then we're also ramping up the standards in terms of accessibility. So wheelchair housing provision, as well as uh, the enhanced uh, Part L standards of the building regulations. Thanks. Uh, lastly, for me is around some of the key wider benefits of here, of what the AAP seeks to do, obviously, overall, we're seeking to substantially enhance the built and environmental quality of the place. Um, that we're looking for a very integrated community as well. We're looking to target uh, the widest range of, of residents from um, those more senior as well, looking to downsize looking for a place where it's easily accessible, it has all the amenities locally for them as well as great connections to everywhere else they need to be, as well as uh, those that are working and living in the area as well. Um, and right through to families, there are housing that we're promoting on site as well as flatter development. Um, we want to see those significant improved connectivities where we provide new community facilities within NEC. We hope that they will be of benefit as well to the wider area and those strategic connectivities will allow people to, uh, within the surrounding communities to access those facilities, as well as improvements offsite that the NEC can provide and again uh, provide connections from from this part of NEC to, to other parts within uh, the wide area. Um, and a key one for us, I think Terry's already touched on, is looking at the range of employment offer here. At the moment, we have very much uh, a focus on the science, life sciences uh, and high tech office provision as well. Um, but then we have the industrial floor space, which is really key to a sustainable local economy. And through the AAP, we're kind of promoting uh, to bridge those gaps as well through more maker space, um, more affordable workspace, uh, small, medium enterprise spaces as well, move on spaces too. So significant employment opportunity, both construction and post construction as well, that we need to maximize the benefits of to the local community as well and and really make um, most of the new facilities that will be provided here.
Thanks. Thanks very much, much Matt, and um, a helpful overview there. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start coming to some of the questions. You can see up on the screen at the moment, we've got the list of events that we've done, ones that are coming up as well. And um, you can find that on the website um, and some events that we're coming up. And what I'm going to do now is I'll leave that up for a minute so you can see them. We'll actually come to some of these questions here. Um, there's a couple of questions on plan B. So I'm going to come to Caroline potentially for that um, in terms of strategy. Um, if the water treatment work plant doesn't go ahead. Caroline, are you happy to answer that? Yeah, I mean, we we are clear that if the water treatment works doesn't get approved, then, then we would need to find uh, alternative locations for those 3,900. Mm -hmm. Plan B. At this stage, we still think there's a reasonable prospect of that coming forward. And and, and um, but it, but clearly, if it if that changes, then we would need to look again. And our what our evidence does is look at a whole range of different strategic spatial options. Um, and we've also looked at a significant number of, of of site options. So we would have to look and see. Well, if our most sustainable location is not available for this plan where is the next most sustainable location um, and we would need to look really long and hard at that honestly because um, that's a, quite a significant number of homes to find we would have to look at those other locations like around the edge of Cambridge that would involve looking at Greenbelt we'd need to look at um, other locations that are well served on public transport routes do we look at another new settlement do we look at expanding others further? Um, and we, we would have to refresh our, our strategy. Um, but at this stage, we haven't done that. And I don't think that's the right thing for us to do at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, okay, I've got another question here. And, and I think that there's some of these I can point direction in, um, in the chat afterwards to where some of these have already been picked up in our FAQs. And I think, does the assessment of North East Cambridge's sustainable location include the consideration of the carbon or environmental costs of decommissioning and moving the sewage works? And of course, I think that we've answered this previously, but just to iterate, obviously, any development that took place on NEC would obviously be subject to our policy plan and policy framework in place at that stage. And hopefully we would have our, um, our, our carbon policies in place by that stage. So actually it, it, it would be subject to uh, the planning policies in place at that time. And in as Caroline's mentioned before, it is one of the most sustainable locations for growth as shown in our, um, our uh, sustainability appraisal. Um, I think there's a question around numbers and I'll just touch on this again. I mean, there's a question saying, why are you so pers persistent in exceeding the government's advised numbers for developments? And of course, uh, we're not persistent. <laughs> we have to do a job um, and we have explained. And I think one of the things is, was very clear in the jobs and homes webinar, which was actually, I think, our second session. Um, it really went into detail about why we felt the need that locally we needed to um, really look at those figures properly. Um, because obviously local need is, is the most important thing is whether you think government has a clear view on what is needed locally or not. Um, but certainly we feel and what's incumbent upon us as, um, as planners and people who are preparing plan is to prepare a sound plan that meets its objectively assessed needs. And actually there's a lot of work went into that. I don't know if any others want to say anything to that, Stephen or Caroline, um, but um, you know, yeah, please do come in. Well, I, I, I mean, I think I think what we would what we would argue is that what we're doing on behalf of the communities is identifying the need that we believe will arise and planning for it. Um, we're not necessarily following the government's um, uh, housing figure, but that's because we, from the work we've done, we sincerely believe that the need that the area will experience for new homes and jobs is different. Uh, and uh, if we don't plan for that, we do you all a huge disservice in Greater Cambridge because it means that there aren't enough homes for the population that want to live here. Uh, and um, there are that has only one impact, which is to increase the price uh, of uh, property as those who are more able to purchase it are able to outbid the people who may already be here or the families of people who, who may well already be here. Uh, and it also means that local businesses 
uh, face the same challenge when they're looking for premises or they want to expand or uh, many long standing businesses may well wish to expand um, and the price of um, business accommodation uh, excludes them. The second thing probably I said there's only one but there's two. The second thing is that actually all of those people end up coming to Greater Cambridge, they just drive uh, and uh, use public transport and so on. So um, I don't think we're abandoning it. What we think we've done is identify what we think we need to plan for to meet the needs that the area is going to um, uh, experience. And just, uh, Paul, I don't think you fully covered off the point that was raised about the carbon footprint of relocation. Uh, I think the question related to whether or not um, uh, the, the net effect of redeveloping uh, North East Cambridge and the water treatment works had been considered. And I think Caroline, just to highlight, I think Caroline highlighted that the sustainability appraisal that's associated with the local plan um, is one of those areas in which the consideration of the cumulative effects of the local plan uh, will, will be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thanks for that clarification as well. So just a couple more questions here. Um, I think I can see Terry is, is, is typing an answer for this. Some questions around green walls and pieces like that, which are some design pieces, which maybe you'd be interested in. Do you want to do you want to do you want to answer that one live, Terry, and save your save your fingers from typing? <laughs> it's too late. Speak to it. But no, oh, yes, sorry, uh, no, okay. yeah, no. Green walls are an important part of the overall strategy for North East Cambridge, alongside kind of green roofs as well. That's not just a kind of aesthetic thing, but actually, there's two real valid reasons. One is biodiversity. Um, you know, th there's a lot you can do, um, you know, uh, particularly for the, the smaller species and things around green green roofs and walls, uh, but also in terms of the kind of the thermal properties of buildings and how they work. So thinking about the kind of heat island effect and how you can use green walls and that to actually help to sort of, you know, um, uh, maintain um, sort of building temperatures and, and heat loss and things. So, yeah, there, there's kind of it's a, it's a double sided coin on that one. Thanks, Terry. Um, I know we're a little bit over. We've only got a couple of questions left, so I'm going to spin through them. Um, there's a question here around um, parking provision. Um, who will there be for people who are not qualifying for blue badge, have great difficulty, and um, perhaps only temporary in walking more than a very short distance? Matt, I can see you're often ready to go with this one. Yeah, yeah. So we are. We've made provision. Obviously, I think in Obviously, blue badge parking will be outside of the residential dwellings uh, and as close as possible to those as well. There's parking will be for servicing as well for service vehicles and things like that. Uh, in terms of people with mobility issues, we're making provision for mobility scooters, electric mobility scooters in particular, um, to facilitate those as well. We recognise that um, there will be a wide range of different types of, um, uh, beyond just bikes, uh, different types of ways and means of getting around. Um, and other than that, we're looking at uh, internal trips through uh, a sort of localized um, shuttle services and things like that to, to move people internally around the place as well so they will connect up with the local bus networks too so there'll be a wide range of different sustainable modes of travel within the area not just walking and cycling thanks matt um question here on if the emerging policy isn't written which reads and leaves a policy vacuum um in terms of being wider than a dco yeah do you want me to do that one as well uh yeah i mean we've got both local plans were adopted 2018. They are the extent planning policies. They account for the current circumstances on site and therefore any development that comes forward ahead of uh, either the emerging local plan or the AAP will need to be dealt with in terms of the extent existing planning policies that are there. So there's no policy vacuum as such uh, that both of the emerging local plan and AAP recognize a future opportunity, but that opportunity is subject to the, the success of the DCO process. So uh, the extent pol policies reflect the current circumstances on site. So a, a and good I think, assessing and it. I and I think just to add to that, it under circumstances that um, 
the water treatment works didn't relocate and I wasn't sure if that might have also been part of the question we would obviously need to look afresh at whether we needed additional policies to cover places like the science park and the area around the station and so on so um, we would we would reflect on whether we needed anything additional. Thanks Caroline and actually just walk on with this last question I think just to clarify again so there's a question around the sustainability appraisal in terms of the um, embodied carbon um, and obviously the contamination of the existing waterworks, will the soil of the old works be taken away as it has high metallic content from sewage? Do you want to just explain the sustainability appraisal piece that Stephen touched on um, in relation to the, um, in the movement of the water treatment works? Caroline, just to, just to touch on that. Well, the, the local plan and the air action plan are predicated on the water treatment works having having relocated. Um, so the air action plan clearly needs to understand the risk of contamination and there is a contamination study as part of um, the evidence supporting the air action plan which has looked at what conditions them ground conditions there might be and how they might need to be addressed um, and the sustainability appraisal also looks at and understands um, what risks there may be to soil and so on as part of that sustainability process um, but we look at we, we are looking at this just to be clear on the basis of a site post relocation of the water treatment works on the basis that it will relocate that's the only way that we can be clear on a site being available uh, for development. Just to add to Caroline's as well, I mean, modern technology allows us to treat most contaminants on site. So that, gone are the days where you used to just dig up the soil and move it off site and bury it in a landfill somewhere. Uh, now the environmental regulations pretty much require nearly all of the contaminants to be treated at site, on site, on source. Um, which limits the amount of excavation that's required and then it's remediated on site as well to make it fit for purpose. So only really where you've got some very noxious stuff that, that has to be taken off and it has to be treated in a proper um, proper processing plant to, to deal with those um, very noxious chem chemicals, which we're not anticipating here, sorry. yeah. Thank you, Matt. That's, that's a very helpful clarification. So I'm going to wrap up now, and then I just wanted to thank everybody for um, for coming along, and um, not just the panel who've been great, uh, but also all of you for coming in and joining in and getting involved in the discussion and giving us your thoughts and questions. As I said at the beginning, there will be um, this will go up live, including the slide deck, um, onto our website. I think it probably will be by the end of the week. Usually, it's pretty quick. Um, we'll deal with those things pretty quickly. Um, but other than that, we have got no more webinar sessions. So this was the last one. You'll be quite glad to know those of you who've been to every single one. You don't have to look at my face anymore. Um, but you might be able to look at it in recording if you really wanted to. Um, but have a lovely week, all of you. And thank you for attending. And thanks to the panel. And I'll see you all soon.